I've lived there 28 years. I know a lady picks her up on Friday in a silver car. She comes back, her hair is different. I'll bet she gets her hair done. She has to love red because she wears a red jacket all the time till it's full of holes and the next one I see is brand new and it's still red. So red has to be Ann's favorite color. I could observe Ann for 28 years and I could stand here and discourse Ann and actually talk about Ann for about 15 minutes as if I know Ann. But until I go knock on her door, and look her in the eyes and say, hello, my name's Dan, I'm your neighbor. And I'll touch her hand and she touches mine. And I say, hey man, my name's Dan. It's just a pleasure to meet you. And I look into her eyes and she says, hi, my name's Ann. I can't tell you I know her. But I can talk about her, I can observe her, and I can be right next door. Oh, I hope that's setting in you. I don't want my Bible knowledge to take the place of knowing Him. Come on. I don't want to sit my whole life and hear all about the goodness of God and sing all them songs and find deep, deep, deep down in my heart I don't get it or I'm discouraged or misunderstanding because, well, yeah, but we're singing how great He is and yeah, but where was He when and how come? And now i got this impersonal understanding of God and He's out there somewhere and I keep coming to church and I go through the motions because it's right, but yet I'm cut off from being with Him. You think that don't happen? That could be happening to people in this room as awesome as the setting is. Because you join to the setting and it takes the place of knowing Him. You find your identity and what you become a part of instead of the one that's in you. So people gravitate to great worship, great preaching, a happening thing. When something's growing big, people come and make sure it gets bigger. You'd be amazed how much that's attached to to find yourself in what you're attaching to instead of who's in you. And you'll slowly be a detriment actually to that setting and create ministry instead of become ministers. I'm just talking plain. I'm not saying that's you as an individual. I'm saying, man, don't let that be you. Why? Because you have a right and access to Him. And I'm going to prove it. I'm going to teach you. Oh, my goodness, where time. Ah. It's tough when you live in eternity. It's tough, man. It's tough. It's hard. Because I'm going to break you out here and let you take a break. At lunch, we're coming back at 2, right? Because this could be a blur, you know. This, it, wasn't, it wasn't Mississippi, wasn't it, that first time? We just started bringing in food, didn't we? They did a 10, 2, and 7. What was they thinking every day that first time? And I think it was just a big, long blur. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I better redeem time. Go to Mark 3 real quick. I want to teach you something here. I, I hope I can impart this. And Do you understand that Jesus wants you, that God loves you? Listen, no man comes to the Father unless he's drawn by Him. The fact that you're even considering the things of God, that your heart is even God's word, is because grace is pulling you. If grace is pulling you, what's that mean? God's drawing you. Why is He drawing you? He wants you. He loves you. He's calling you out of darkness. He's snatching you away. We misread, we judge our desires, we say, oh, well, if I was really serious, my life wouldn't look like this and this. And we constantly judge our tree by the fruit. Remember that thing we've been hitting all morning? And the best thing you can do is nail down that you're a good tree. You say, yeah, but Dan, you don't know what I just did. Well, you know what you just did. And you can, I can tell in your tone that you know it wasn't the Lord. So why don't you lift your hands to God when nobody's looking and separate yourself from what happened and say that is so not who I am God I don't even know where the capacity came but I thank you you're grooming me you're raising me up in wisdom and understanding and you're maturing me thank you for the light in my life that shows me that for what it really is that is not my desire my heart is not to sin and I thank you for your unfailing love God I thank you your love doesn't enable me it transforms me that is not who I am three years ago I'd have did that and wouldn't even blinked but now I see it clear for what it is and it is not the kingdom in my life. So thank you, God, that it is not my life. You have made me a good tree and you have empowered me today, made me wiser, sharper, and smarter. Your grace is having its perfect way in me. You say, you would pray like that if you messed up? How would you pray? 
Well, I don't know. You know, going into prayer. There's a lady back home who came to a healing service. And she lined up for prayer. It was in the day when I just prayed for everybody and let momentum build and manifest it. <laughs> and it was fun, but it wasn't Jesus. He didn't want me to do that. He asked me how many people I was training and equipping, who was I multiplying, who was I imparting to. I said, well, I'm just having a blast. He said, how about training up some people? <laughs> I said, okay. But, but in that day, I was just manifesting, man. <laughs> Fire. <laughs> but I got up to this lady and I was like, you know, Holy Spirit's amazing. And he just smells things. And I said, honey, what's wrong with your blood? You have something in your blood. What's, what's going on in your blood? She got real nervous. And uh, she said, diabetes? And I, and I don't like diabetes at all. It hurts, folks. It is so not good. I've been seeing it really getting hammered by the gospel, too. We have this one guy, just, I just emailed me, 40 years insulin dependent. Nine, 12 days in a row, no insulin, a 109. With insulin, he was a 165 to 180. Wow. <laughs> just fun stuff. She said diabetes, so I'm like, diabetes. Right? So we attacked it, man. So the truth was she didn't have diabetes. I thought, well, she's never going to get it. It's, it's going to be so afraid to even come near her. It's going to say, if I get near her and that crazy guy shows up, man. Diabetes. Oh, we just, you never again. God didn't show me it wasn't there. He didn't give me discernment. He left me pray with all my heart for that woman. Why? Because she knew she lied and she saw me pray with all my heart and it convicted her and made her feel bad that she lied to me and I'm giving my whole heart to her in prayer and it's not even the thing. She got home, it tore her up. Two days later, she came in my office trembling. She said, I lied to the man of God. She's a precious black sister. She's dramatic too. And she says, I lied to the man of God. She said, I lied to the man of God. And she was, she was like, God a sinner. I was like, oh, I love it. There's a black church I minister to downtown. I go there. I don't even want to preach. I just love it. I grew up in the city, man. I love passion. I love emotion. I love it. Pastor never, I've never one time seen pastor in a worship service where his face wasn't covered with tears. I love it. Well, she came from that circle. So she has that in her. And I love it. She says, I lied to the man of God. She's in my office. I'm like, slow up, honey. Wait. She's going to get into preaching or something. I said, back up. Why would you have lied? She looked at me, trembled, and broke. She had HIV that turned into AIDS. She was 106 pounds, six foot woman, should have been 150, normal. 106 is scary light for a 150, six foot woman. All her friends, what's wrong with you? Why are you so thin? Thin is good, thin is good. She never told nobody why. Because when she turned 50, she got into that crazy, psychological, world-driven, midlife, whatever they got terms for out there. Please don't fill your heart with that junk. That's right. It's like we all have the knowledge of all that stuff. Empty nest syndrome. That's Adam. That's the fall of man. What is that? That's insecurity in Christ, and that's an indictment that you don't know the gospel. Why do you even think that that's normal, acceptable, and that shouldn't even sit at the table with you? That shouldn't have a right to pull up a chair at the king's table. Oh, Empty nest syndrome. Are you kidding me? What is so, so now my fulfillment isn't fulfilled, so everybody around me was my identity, but I sing to Jesus that he's my everything? And now everybody moved on and I'm empty, so I have to sleep with somebody and violate my conscience? Leave my husband or my wife because they ain't working no more because now we raised our kids and I don't see the value in them, so let's go find another. What? 
empty nest syndrome. It might work for the world and make sense. It should be ludicrous to the church. Ludicrous, like insane. Oh, forgive my, uh, am, I, am I okay? Yes. 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 That stuff should be like, Come on. what are we thinking? We buy in, we get loaded with all this natural knowledge and we seem to think it's the way. It's the way that seems right. But if you look at it through the gospel, it makes no sense at all. Come on. Come on. Uh. She turned 50. She says, That's why I'm so passionate. You see, angry without sin, this stuff torques me. You know why? Because of this story. Because here's a woman bitten by that snake. Now she's 50 and she doesn't feel like a woman. Well, what makes you a woman? Sleeping with a guy? Does that make you a woman? Come on, there's guys out there that will sleep with you. I don't care what you look like, smell like. I don't care your figures. They'll sleep with you because you got the right parts. I'm just being raw and real. Why we thought that that means somebody loves me. No, they're using you and they got an urge and a drive that they need to satisfy and you're better than them doing it themselves. Now how about if we get raw? This dear lady who loves Jesus falls into deception. Now we're ready to burn her on a cross like a witch and a harlot if we don't understand. I have compassion on these people, but that lie, I have no mercy for. You can tell. So she's precious. She needs free. She's been bitten, man. Guess what she does? She starts sleeping with men in the church. And the men obliged her vulnerability. And probably some outside the church. She gave herself around a little bit because the more men that wanted her, she was riding this wave of delusion. Wow, I must still got it. No, men are men and they need delivered. Because men in Christ aren't going to oblige her. A man in Christ wouldn't even dream of it. A man in Christ would minister her vulnerability and tell her there ain't no way I honor you way too much. You are so much more than this girl. I promise you. We got our manhood and our womanhood defined through the fall. You ought to take that thing way back to the beginning before there was a lack of innocence and a loss of innocence and sin consciousness. You might be amazed what we look like in Christ sexually. You might be amazed how we are in Him. Don't tell me I'm this and I'm this and I'm this because you studied fallen man and now you're trying to put that resume on me. I'm born again. <laughs> and I'm so free. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you really think Jesus made us that way where we're driven? To live at the expense of others? To slide in, make moves, say things that get us our way? You think Jesus made us that way or do you think we became that way? You young ladies, don't you fall into that snare. And men, don't you ever use a woman that way. Ever. <clears throat> she slept around with these guys, and guess what happened? <clears throat> HIV grabbed her. Now it's full-blown AIDS, and we got a problem. She can't cry out for help. She's so ashamed because she should know better because she's a church lady. Now she can't tell nobody because she's so ashamed. She's horrified. So she sneaks into a healing service without saying what it is, just hoping to catch a break. And Holy Spirit wants to help her, so I walk by her and I go, what's in your blood? Straight up, freaked her out. That's why she said, you're a man of God. I said, what are you talking about? She said, you knew what was in my blood. I said, well, yeah, there's, you said diabetes. She said, I didn't have diabetes. I sure prayed with all my heart. <laughs> she told me how bad she felt when I prayed so hard. Watch this. This is stuff we learn as we go, man. She said, I have HIV. It's turned into AIDS. I'm so afraid that I'm going to die. I said, honey, why didn't you just tell me? She said, she bawled so hard she couldn't talk for a while. And then when she pulled herself together, she said, because I'm so ashamed. She said, I said, how'd you get AIDS? Ah! 
I said, talk to me, honey. Had my door shut. She said, I've been sleeping with men. And she told me the whole story when I turned 50, something happened. I started, and I finally I slept with this man, and I draw this false sense of something, and then another man, another man. Next thing you know, I got eight. And I said, listen, honey, I'm not going to pray for you, okay? She looked at me. Said, I'm not praying for you. I said, AIDS isn't killing you. Shame is. I said, do you have a best friend? She said, yeah. I said, who's your best friend? She said her name. I said, is that how you ended up at this church? You know her? She said, she's my girl. I said, well, knowing her, she's going to slap you first. <laughs> when you tell her. I said, girlfriend, why didn't you let me know? And then... So I can pray with you and love you. And then, then she's going, I said, she doesn't even know. She said, she don't know. I said, you go tell her what's in your blood and how it got there. You have her James 5, that thing, and pray for you that you might be healed. Now watch. You can live condemned. You can say, the mercy of God is amazing. Here's what I've learned. The devil cannot defeat and stop the mercy of God. That's right. Jesus. Whew. Here's what receives mercy. A broken, repentant, contrite heart. A heart that's sincerely full of godly sorrow that doesn't deserve another chance but gets one because they see clearer than they've seen before and they're broken. It's not to allow them to sleep with people and get away with it. Mercy is not so you can sleep with them and get away with it. Mercy is so you can get reestablished on a healthy foundation and never give yourself to that trivial flesh-driven stuff again. And when he says to the woman that committed adultery, he says, who are thine accusers? Or where are thine accusers? Because he said, who hasn't committed sin? Throw the first stone. From the oldest to the youngest, there's some significance there. From the oldest to the youngest, they all drop their stones. But guess what? We don't realize. We think, wow, he sure showed them and disqualified them, put the rocks out of their hand. He had a right lawfully, legally. He could have picked up a rock and killed her because he was completely blameless according to the law. He could have executed righteous judgment and judged her under the law for her adultery because he was absolutely qualified because he had no sin. He who has no sin cast the first stone. Guess who had no sin? Guess who didn't pick up a rock? He is the rock. Yeah. And you fall on him and are broken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So guess what he said? Where are thine accusers? She said, there are none, Lord. Now he just put himself in the position to stone her. And he said, I accuse you neither. Go and sin no more. If you're not careful, you hear that as, now you better not go do this again. What he's saying is, I don't accuse you because I don't see you for this. You're more than this. Now go, don't ever live this way again. We hear it as a law. You better not go do this again. Now she's under the weight of law. If you wake up in the morning and try not to sin, you'll be so sin conscious by noon, it's ridiculous. If you wake up and enjoy your son and put on righteousness, you'll actually live holy till lunchtime. And you can't even hardly talk about the possibilities of God's grace in our life because we're so relate to sin that we think it's heresy when you talk about living free. You say, what are you saying? You're perfect? Not even saying that. I'm saying I've been made pure and it takes you a long way. I ain't looking to sin. I'm looking to manifest Him. You say, yeah, but brother, we all have sin. We say, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and make him a liar. And you pull that little one-liner out of John 1 and don't even know what it's really saying because in text it's not even saying what you're making it say. He says, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin. If you say you have no sin, you're deceived and make a liar. What he's saying is if you have no need for the blood. What blood? Hey, I'm a good guy. I make apple pies for Millie. I do nice things. He's saying, but if you confess your sin, he's faithful just to cleanse you, forgive you of all unrighteousness and cleanse you. And he says, if you say you have not sinned, he clarifies it two verses later, what he was saying, we pull the one liner out and bind ourselves to the identity of sin. Verse 1 of chapter 2 says, little children, I write these things to you so you do not sin. We're so busy pulling out the one-liner, we don't even know what it's saying. Yeah. 
You jump into the there, there for it. It's so dangerous. You don't even know what it's there for. Are you guys all right? Yes. Come on. He says, I write these things to you, little children, so you do not sin. He didn't say, but when. He said, but if you do. You know what? There's so much accusation of heresy and blasphemy on this topic. I'm going to go with Jesus. I'm going to stick with Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to let my own conscience be free. I'm going to trust myself to Him. But I don't talk freely about it and openly and share my life because people would go on a witch hunt and they wouldn't be able to hear me anymore. They'd, well, he, this, and he, that. You can live a whole lot freer than you believe. If you fix your eyes on righteousness, it'll produce its fruit to holiness and you ain't trying to be holy. You see the tree is good and the fruit's automatic. You don't have to try not to be angry. Try not to be jealous. Try not to be... That's works. You won't be able to do it. You become it in a place of relationship, yieldedness, and intimacy. All the clay does is yield to the master creativity of the potter. You put yourself in his hand, pliable and useful and ready, and he shapes you and molds you and makes you and unveils you and goes, ta-da! And you can't take any credit for the way you live. All glory goes to God because you are what you are by the grace of God. But guess what you did do? You laid down your rights and you gave up the right to be angry, offended, judgmental, prideful, expectations. And you've just submitted yourself to Him so you can become love. And oh man, nothing but love. Are you guys following me? This lady I was telling you about, I didn't see her for three months. She never came back to church. Three months. You know why? Because she did what I asked her to do and her first test came up negative. So she knew that they would test her three months in a row to make sure they didn't get a bad reading because that's what they do. They test you three months straight. So she wanted to make sure she had her three-month confirmation to come back and tell me it was a testimony. She walked in my office three months later, 153 pounds with no HIV in her blood. Why? Because mercy triumphs over judgment. Was she wrong? Of course she was wrong. Did she know it? Yeah. Was she under the veil and deception of shame? Yep. But when humility took that off and she cried out to a friend, it was like crying out to God. And when she cried out to God on her behalf, mercy triumphed over judgment. Don't tell me it's right to live condemned. Don't tell me to feel bad for three days about what you did is cool. To catch it in the moment and take it to God and peel it off and separate it from who you are is how you're going to grow and manifest and mature. What, do you think I'm flagrant where sin's concerned? Do you think I'm making sin light, a light thing? So you think I got a whole bunch of sin in my life and I'm just preaching to God, hey, God loves us. That is the last person I have. I don't even have room for it. I heard, who was it? I think it was Bill Johnson said, what would I do with sin? It's like a third shoe. (laughs) See, we don't understand it. When you catch the, when you get a revelation of what sin was in our lives, man, it drives you to righteousness. Sometimes you need that revelation. Like the land of Pharaoh was a land of bondage. Did you ever hear the psalmist say things like the miry clay? Did you ever hear a phrase in the church about being pulled out of the miry clay? Do we sing songs like that? It's in your Bible, miry clay. Did you ever see the Charlton Heston movie, Moses, years ago? Did you see what the Israelites were doing? They were in the mud pits, guys. They were in the miry clay pits. It's the land of bondage. I was laying on my couch one day reading the story, and the Lord said, Dan, that's symbolic of the land of sin. The bondage was sin. They were under Pharaoh. He's the taskmaster. He's symbolic of the devil. It's all pointing to the New Testament. It's all revealing something. And I realized, oh my goodness, they're in the mud, treading in the miry clay, and it's all symbolic of sin. Here's why. What they're doing is making bricks to build the kingdom of another. 
The children of God that are made for God's image to manifest His name to the nations are in pits of mud making monuments for Pharaoh. And the Lord said, Dan, that's what sin does. It accomplishes the kingdom of the enemy and it builds monuments for his sake and in his name. And he said, it's the mocking of their created value when people give themselves to a sin consciousness and identity because they're made to live in righteousness and bear fruit towards my image and for my image. And when men are stuck in sin, they're just building the kingdom of another at the cost of their God-given identity and purpose. That's intense. Once you get a revelation like that, you, you are tempting me. It's like, it's like, okay, watch this. So if I don't like chocolate ice cream, can you tempt me with it? <laughs> so if I really see it for what it is, is it tempting? See, we don't get that in the church. God tempts no man. You're only tempted when you're drawn away by your own desires. Probably ought to lay them at the foot of the throne and give them to Him in the place of secret prayer and then come out of that place sanctified and redeemed. <laughs> but if you don't think you can go there, you've got a problem. You better believe you can go there because you see you have a high priest, Jesus, the Son of God who's passed through the heavens. It's Hebrews 4. It's there. You come boldly into the throne of grace and receive mercy and help in a time of need. Is His door open? Is He busy and on the phone or is He waiting to receive you? Probably ought to go through the door. Yeah. On your worst day, it would be good to run to Him the days of fig leaves and hiding are over. Amen. Come on. That's good. When you try to hide your own sin and cover your own sin, you're in a constant state of shame and awareness of sin. God comes in Genesis 3 at the end of the chapter and He pulls off the fig leaves and puts animal skins on them. We all preach the blood covenant. Every preacher preaches the blood covenant and it's true. The animal's blood had to be spilled to get their skins. I understand it's all gospel. But we miss the righteous revelation there. Here's the deal. God doesn't want you sin conscious because every day Adam and Eve woke up in those fig leaves, what are they thinking of? The day they missed God. If they wake up in the animal skins, what are they thinking of? The day he received them and he was still a father and he gave them a promise of hope and proclaimed a seed to come. That's why you reckon yourself dead indeed to sin, alive unto God. Don't present your members as unto unrighteousness, but unto righteousness for its fruit, unto holiness. You give yourself to him as his. Amen? Three times in Romans 6 it says you're free from sin. Three times. Hebrews 10 says that if the old way they did it was sufficient, the worshipers once perfected would have had no more consciousness of sin. He goes on and talks about the new covenant and the new one that's coming. And he said he takes away the first and he applies this one. And he says now we're perfected forever and we stand before him without the consciousness of sin. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Yeah. So this is what takes you to him. Okay, I have to stop. Oh my goodness, I have to stop. I'm just going to stop. Oh, I don't ever want to stop. Oh. No, I'm going to stop. I am. I'm going to stop. No, I don't want to, but I feel like I'm going to stop. I'm supposed to stop, but I don't want to. I'm just telling you, I don't want to. Okay, I, I know. I, I, I don't want <laughs> No, really. He, well, I'm going to release you guys. You can get up and stretch and eat and come back and be fresh. And we'll just keep going, okay? So I, we don't have to just keep going. Oh. So let's just stop. I'm not, there's not going to be ministry and stuff right now. You guys get something out of this this morning? Yeah. I want to, yeah. No, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying that for, for like just that, but, but I really want, you guys are hearing this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, if what I'm preaching wasn't for everybody and it wasn't for us, come on, why would I even be here? What would we be doing? Right. Yeah. 
You know, I've heard this in my life. Watch, I've heard this, and I'm not boasting to myself. I've just heard people say this way too much. Well, I've never met anybody like you. Wow, you're amazing. Wow, you're like an enigma, brother. You have an amazing grace on your life. Wow, you're just different. And I'm none of those. I just believe He loves me and I'm receiving His grace and understand why I'm a Christian and I'm crying out from the rooftops for us to just realize why we're Christians. I appreciate you trying to say those things. It's not a compliment to me. It's like, look, if what I was preaching wasn't for you, if I couldn't have what I'm preaching, I would never come to hear me speak. Because then I'm just wowing you. Passing time, entertaining you or something. Look, if you couldn't have what I'm saying, why would you even be here? Why would God cry it out? What's he teasing you? Hey, look what I did for him, but I ain't doing it for you. Ah. <laughs> Come on. People say, well, Dan, you had a sovereign revelation. You had a divine experience. You had a... And people, it's amazing how we try to spiritualize what I'm preaching to exclude people. We are all called to know him. We are all called to be filled with His Spirit and be fashioned after His image. We are all called to walk in love. We are all called to have union and communion with Him. And He made it possible to always have an unveiled face and run to Him. You've got to make sure that you aren't your own worst enemy because you're the only one that can keep you from Him. Well, is something blocking me? Yeah, it's you. <laughs> then you want to get mystical and go through three years of deliverance and it's just you. Look, I have never seen, I have never seen a change strong enough to hold somebody that really wanted to be with him. I have never seen God say, oh, press harder, maybe you'll break the chain. Come, oh, come, pull, tug, leap. It's what you're thinking and believing that makes you feel blocked. It has, watch this, I'm going to get straight now and you might not like this. It has nothing to do with your past. It has to do with what you're believing about your ability to approach Him and how He sees you in the moment. There is nothing that can keep you from Him but you. That's why the just live by faith. You say, Dan, you're being unfair. Not everybody can believe that. Everybody's called to believe that. There's a measure of faith in every man. You've got to push this aside and say, wait a minute, none of this stuff matters. You love me. You've proved it on the cross. Your love is proven. And you step into that room and you close the door and say, God... It felt like I couldn't come here, but I am here, and I believe you love me. If a Christian would break out and do that, it would change everything. Because then language would increase. So you could take the communion elements to increase the language. Lord Jesus, you gave your body for me. What else can it mean? You took blows upon your flesh to get me free. Oh my goodness, I received covenant, and thank you for this love. Oh, the blood of the... Now you're not praying about your neighbors, your family, your kids, and your job. You're actually in love communing with Him. It's an intimate place. Then your other prayers will have greater power and strength because you're coming from the place of knowing Him. Are, are you all good? I said I'm done and I'm still preaching. Leave. I'm done. I'm done. Hold on. Don't, don't get up yet. Everybody stay sitting for one minute just because I've got to give you... We had a couple adjustments. Stop Sarah Pemberton at the door. Bless God. We're going to... Because otherwise, if you don't hear this, okay, one of the things is, one of the, we, would, we, would, we would be failing, not only just failing, but we would miss it if we hear a message like this and then just go try to run through a restaurant and be rude to everybody we meet trying to get back, right? So what if we just moved our start time for the afternoon back to 2.30? Because honestly, let's put legs on love. One of the great ways that we can go out and we can begin to become love is by, by just taking time to be loving the places that we go to have lunch. Put it into practice right away. And I want to encourage you, when you come back this afternoon, Dan spoke something that I want to encourage you, our, our love for others and our eager desire for the word of truth equals great growth in our lives and the lives of those around us. How many of you, when he spoke about the milk truck, you're like, that makes a lot of sense. See, I believe if you love milk, you make room for a truck. I'll find some Cheerios. <laughs> First, Peter said this, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. He's talking about love. All of the things that keep us from loving as newborn babes, born again, desire the pure milk of the word that you grow thereby if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. How many of us are tasting that the Lord is gracious this morning? I want to tell you, today's a day of great growth. It's a day of increase, the sowing, the watering. But this is why coming to him 
as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. This is the invitation, exhortation to you. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you. This afternoon, come hungry, come thirsty. Move some things out of the driveway of your heart and just say, God, if you got a milk truck, just back it up. Bring it in. Come on now. Dump it all on me. I'll take everything I get and then just bring some doggy bags for people who don't show up. Amen? But let's go ahead and move start time back to 2.30.